Hey, y'all. This is Troy Black. So I have a prophetic word to share with you today that has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I know a lot of assumptions may be made as soon as I say that, or even seeing the title or the thumbnail of this video. I'm going to address those at the start of this video before I move on to sharing that word. But I want to start by praying, just inviting the presence of the Lord here. I know he's already here, but I believe that as we turn our attentions to God during this time, that the Holy Spirit can actually begin to work in mighty ways in hearts, in lives, in people's bodies, and for those that need he physical healing, in minds, in, in emotions, souls, you know, like the, the parts of our, our existence that needs healing from past wounds, the, the parts of our uh, identities that have been influenced by deception and lies from the enemy. You know, a lot of times, one of the thing that stops us as Christians from walking into all that God has for us and doing all that He has for us to do is simply that we're still holding on to old ways of thinking. And that could be from our carnal nature, it could be from the old covenant, or it could even be from a lie from the devil. And I believe that God wants to address some of those things today. So I'm going to start by praying. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your presence here. Jesus, I thank you for dying for us. You died on a cross to pay the price for the, the consequences, the, the sins of every single person here listening, Lord, myself included. You took those consequences upon yourself so that we could be forgiven. We could be made righteous in God's eyes, that we could be set free so that we could walk out that righteousness. We could walk out the good calling you have for us. Lord, the purpose that you have for us being here. And I just thank you, Jesus, that you invited us into friendship when you brought forth the message of reconciliation to God. It, that means that you've given us the, the opportunity to be friends with God again. You've given us the opportunity to, to draw near to you confidently, freely, without fear, without shame, without condemnation. We have friendship with the Father because of what you have done for us, Jesus. We walk out that friendship through your Holy Spirit leading us, being with us. I just thank you for the acceptance we have, Father, because of what Jesus did for us. And I ask that this time to be devoted to you, Lord, dedicated to you, Jesus, that you would receive all the praise, honor, and glory, that this would not be about people, not be about what I want or what anyone else wants, Lord, but that this would be about what you want. And I just ask that you would speak to every heart today in Jesus' name. So I, I just sense this from the Lord. Uh, I, I need to share this right now before I move on. Just that if you're watching this after the fact and, and it's not live, uh, I just hear the, the Holy Spirit saying that he can do just as much in your heart and in your life through this message as if it were live. See, when, when it comes to the what the Holy Spirit is able to do, y'all, the there's time and space are not an issue. He Because... When it's an actual word from God, and, and I'm just going to use the, the scripture as, as the main example. You know, the scripture, the word of God does not return void, right? And the scripture is sharper than a double-edged sword. It has the ability to divide between soul and spirit. It never loses that potential. It never loses that power. And we're, in some cases, thousands of years after the scripture was written, right? And it's like, and it hasn't lost its ability to transform lives. That's what a word from God can do. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right into this. Mm. I saw in the comments some people saying, you know, asking the questions ahead of time, like, is he gonna be giving a date? You know, essentially like when Jesus is coming back. I'm not doing that today. I tried to post that in the comments so people would know ahead of time. But I just want to say that I am not going to uh call a rapture date. I'm not gonna call a second coming date. I've never done that. For those of y'all who have seen my titles like rapture prophecy, things like that. I have never tried to prophesy the date of a rapture or something like that. And the reason is because the word of God says that we will not know. We can see the time, the signs of the times, but we are not going to know the day or the hour. So anyone who tries to prophesy a rapture date, you can immediately know that that message wasn't from God. Now, now that doesn't mean that they're completely off basis. Maybe they made a, a huge mistake, right? But at least that word you don't need to listen to. Okay, so this is what has happened so far. All right. Uh, I recently posted a 
rapture prophecy video in set back in September. If you haven't watched it, I highly encourage you to either watch that before watching this one or after the fact, because this message is kind of built on what the Lord shared there. And even the verses he gave me in the, in the scripture he gave me to teach there. Um, I'm not here to argue rapture theology, <laughs> the difference between the rapture and second coming, you know, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all of that stuff. I'm not here to argue that. Why? Because at the end of the day, Sometimes we get so focused on the details that we miss the calling in the middle of it. And God is not going to, Jesus is not going to return and say, okay, all the rap, pre-trib rapture people come over here. They get to be raptured or, or, you know, or I came back for them. They get to come to the, you know, marriage supper of the lamb. Everyone else go over here. You're in a secondary category. It's like, no, that's not what our righteousness, that's not what our salvation is based on. It's based on our belief in what Jesus did for us at the cross. Okay. So, that is a secondary issue, and we need to stop getting bent out of shape over it. We need to stop arguing and and be, being disunified over that. We can walk in unity uh, as believers around what Jesus did for us on the cross without agreeing on whether there's a rapture or not, number one, without agreeing on what it looks like if there is one, and without agreeing on necessarily the, the difference between rapture, second coming, and what happens in between there. Okay, The scripture gives us all that we need to know, revelation, but... Is it super clear? No. <laughs> Does anyone have a perfect interpretation? Yes, one person, the Holy Spirit. All right, I'm going to move on. So I'm not here to argue rapture theology. Theology. When do I believe Jesus is coming? Based on words that I've heard in the past, I believe his, uh, and one of the words I heard was the rapture is imminent. And, and I know that when God says the rapture there, he's talking about the the end, the second coming, whatever uh, whatever that looks like scripturally. That's what he's talking about there. Okay. It's eminent, but he said, but it's not yet. And based on what I've heard, I believe it could be a lot longer than some believers believe, to be honest. Why? Because the, the scripture says in uh, Peter, either first or second Peter, it talks about how one day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is as one day. And it's talking about that in the context of Jesus's return. Think about that for a second. The scripture itself tells us, hey, even when someone's prophesying and saying Jesus is coming soon, that does not mean necessarily that it's going to be soon in your eyes or in your mind. God might consider it soon, but we might not. So please keep that in mind. Do I, do I claim to know exactly what the rapture and second coming is going to look like? No. Okay. I am here to deliver a prophetic word that I heard from the Lord about what the church is supposed to be doing as we await Jesus's second coming. That is what this video is about today. That's my heart. That's my intention. And if there's anything that I say that you know is not from the Lord, please just discard it. Go And, and I would also encourage you, every prophetic word I share or even anyone else shares, please run it by the scripture. Make sure it aligns with the teachings of God's word. And then pray about it and ask the Holy Spirit for confirmation if you need that. Because God is willing and able to bring confirmation when we when we ask. And, and he wants to. This is what 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3 says. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, he's talking about the second coming, that you do not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. No one is to deceive you in any way. So what's he saying? He's saying, he's saying don't let these things disturb you. He's saying people are going to be sharing all sorts of rumors about when the rapture is happening, what, is, what it's going to look like, when Jesus is coming back, all these different things. He's saying we should be living in such a way to where none of that bothers us at all. It doesn't throw us off track. Why? Because we have a purpose as the church for being here. God created you with a purpose, and he put you in this time in history on purpose. It wasn't an accident. You're here for a reason. And God does not want you to miss what he's given you to do, what he's asked you to do, what he's called you to do. And I don't, I don't want to miss what he's asked me to do. And sometimes all of these questions that we try to answer become ultimately become a distraction from what God is asking us to do. So I'm going to be sharing a prophetic word about what the church is meant to be doing until Jesus' return. And then also I'm going to be addressing six heresies the church is currently dealing with. And you're going to see how these two things connect um, in, a, in a few minutes. But this is something I shared recently um, from a, two, a 2024 prophecy video that I just posted like a week ago. 
Um, and it applies here. So that's why I'm sharing just a, a small fraction of that. If you haven't watched that whole video, that link is going to be below this video description on YouTube. But I heard the Lord say, I'm coming to get her. He's talking about the bride, talking about the body of Christ. I'm coming to get her. But until that day, I'm changing her to look more like me, my motives, my heart, my victories, my servant minded attitude. And then I heard what, sorry, I heard I want what's actually right for her, not what she thinks is right. So sometimes we as the church, as individuals, we can get off track, right? And we can start going off of, after something else. But also as the church over time, we can start to create traditions that ultimately push us off track. A train is only designed to go one direction, and that is wherever the track is leading. See, we have off-road vehicles, right? That they can go all over the place. A train was never designed to be like that. It can only go where the track is leading. And as soon as it starts to go off track, it derails and disaster ensues, right? And disaster has occurred in the church in many cases because of the teachings of people, the teachings of men, as the Bible calls it, the, the teachings of people that were not from the Lord. And so I'm going to be addressing some of those today, but here's, here's what I know is going to happen. I'm only going to address six, three major ones and three minor ones. Okay. There's, there's, but there's dozens of them. Right. But the, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking specifically to hearts as I'm going through this and revealing more uh, that are going to, going to apply even more specifically. Okay. And y'all, you know, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be doing this with love and grace. And I, you know that the Holy Spirit is doing that as well. Okay. What does the word say? It says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. He loves. So discipline with God, most, most of the time it starts with a loving rebuke. Most of the time it starts with, hey, the Holy Spirit gently nudging us and saying, hey, that's not a good way to go. Let's go this way. Come on. Let's come over here. This is where life is found. This is where hope is found. This is where my peace is found. And he uses the peace of God in our lives, in our hearts to direct us. And some of us were wondering, man, I've been going down this track for a while now thinking, why don't I have the peace of God? But maybe if I just keep pushing further, but the answer is no, that's the wrong direction. That's why the peace of God is not there. And it's time to take a step back and re-examine and say, Lord, did you really call me down this way? Or do I need to come back to where your peace can be found? And the Holy Spirit will use that, the fruit of the spirit in our lives to direct our steps, but also the word of God. <laughs> and those things work together. Uh, but I, 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 I received a prophetic dream back on November 9th, and I don't dream very often, y'all. Uh, most of the things I share are visions or prophetic words. I usually don't share dreams. They don't happen to me very often. Um, but I received this on November 9th, and I believe it does apply here. Essentially, what it was, was I was teaching a college class on film production. And I, for those of y'all who don't know, I graduated with a degree in cinematography um, from college. And so it was very similar to, you know, what I had learned in school and that kind of stuff. But in this case, in this dream, I'm, I'm teaching the class, right? And I'm being very like straightforward and passionate in this teach in this dream. And there's students asking questions and I'm like cutting them off and stuff. So I'm, I'm just being super blunt. Right. Uh, but I could in the dream, everyone's getting super excited. And I was getting super excited about this, like, you know, quote unquote breakthrough in, teaching cinematography. Okay. And, and I kept showing these scenes from different films and I kept asking the question, why did they just cut to this shot? Have you ever watched a movie? And it's like, there's two people having an argument, right. Or, or a conversation or something. And it's, it's showing one person and this shows the other person. And then for a split second, it shows the first person again, they don't say anything. And then it cuts back. It's like, why did they make, why did the editor choose to make that cut? And when it comes to someone who actually knows what they're doing, <laughs> a good storyteller, every single cut has a purpose. Okay. Every single frame, every single shot has a purpose. And that purpose is to help tell the next part of the story. So you can judge a good film from a bad film by simply looking at where did that help the story? Or was that just filler? Did they just add that in there to, to save on, to, you know, to have more time on screen? Was that song part of telling the story or did they just feel like, well, we have to have a soundtrack. So let's put something in there. You know, was that character helping to tell the story or did they just 
put the character in there because everybody needs a sidekick, right? Or everybody needs a comedic uh, relief. You know, it's like, were they just following the rules of storytelling or were they truly telling a good story? That's the difference. And in this dream, I, I woke up out of the stream and immediately knew like the main point was every single shot, every single edit and every single cut should be telling the next part of the story. And if it's not, why is it there? Right. And when, and if you would apply this illustration, it's simply a spiritual illustration that the Lord gave me, but if you apply it to our lives as believers, it, we we have to start asking these questions. Did I start this career because God told me to, or was it because I wanted to? And if God told me to, and it sucks right now, there's a reason for that. Okay, there's a reason for that. There's a there's a greater story that God is trying to tell through this. There's some there's a purpose, and I'm using the story to uh, you know to describe the purpose of God in our lives. There's a purpose to this that maybe I'm not seeing right now. And God allowed this cut or this edit or this switch, this shift in my life on purpose so that he could do something through me that he wouldn't, couldn't do any other way. That I couldn't do on my own. And I just sense the Holy Spirit is saying that, you know, many people listening, the Lord is bringing to your mind things that have happened this last year. And for some people, it's been like a year and a half or so. And and he's just he's bringing things up and and re reminding you of things, and saying simply saying this this simple word to you this simple phrase, there's a purpose for that. There's a purpose for that. Now, not everything that comes to your mind is from the Lord, right? Like some things that there were bad decisions, other things was an attack of the enemy. But the things that God allowed and the things that God planned for and the things that God asked us to do that we we did and we're like, that didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out, Lord. There's a purpose for that. There's a reason for that. And God is going to be re revealing those purposes and those reasons as we continue to seek him about those things. But the temptation is going to be to give up on those things. It's to give up. It's to throw it aside and be like, well, that's some bitterness I'm going to carry. And God's just going to have to answer for that when I get to heaven, right? I'm just going to carry that bitterness towards the Lord. I'm not going to talk to him about it anymore. The Lord is saying, don't do that. Don't I hear the Lord saying, don't treat me like that, my bride. The Lord is just saying, my plans for you are better than that. I had a plan the whole time. I didn't let go of my plan just because something didn't go your way. Man, and I just sense the Lord saying this is a season of restoration. Uh, again, I would encourage you to go back and watch that um, 2024 prophecy video that I posted because it, it's exact. It's the same kind of word as that. Now, there's other things in there about what's happening in that in next year, but the Lord spoke very clearly about this season of restoration and renewal of the saints. I would encourage you to go watch that. But I need to get into what God gave me to share today. Okay, so I'm going to be sharing this this word about the second coming, about what the church is meant to be doing until then. These are some scriptures that God pointed me to. And y'all know me. I'm, I don't just share scriptures to throw stuff in there. I pray and I ask God and I say, God, is there anything from your word that you want me to share? And then I wait upon the Lord. And when God gives me stuff, I try to put it in, you know, and ref either at least reference it. But Matthew 24, 44, 45 through 46, I'm not going to read it, but it talks, Jesus in it, Jesus talks about the faithful servant doing the work that, it, that God had asked them to do until the master returns. Okay. So there's work for the church to do. You can go read it for yourself if you want, but there's work for us to do. There's something for us to be doing as we are waiting upon the master's return. Matthew 24, 36, the same chapter says, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, nor, but the father alone. For the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. So this is odd here. If you really read it, it's like Jesus randomly, it feels like he randomly throws Noah into the picture, right? He's like, Jesus is coming back. It's going to be just like Noah, right? Like, you know, it's like, but if you look at it in the context of the story of Noah, Noah you begin to see some parallels here. One of them being uh, the, the judgment, right? We are facing a judgment after Jesus's return. The, the righteous and the wicked are going to be judged in two separate judgments. So it is coming. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more later, but what that looks like a little bit, but also there is a salvation available to us for Noah. 
it was the ark. For us, it's Jesus Christ. But he says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Here's the, here's the question. What did Noah do during the days of Noah? What was Noah doing? This is Hebrews 11, 7. It says, by faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not seen yet, not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. There's a lot of by faiths in there. So what are we meant to be doing as Christians? We're meant to be walking by faith, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. But also, we're meant to live this life with a godly fear. It says he was motivated by a godly fear. Now, that does not mean a fear of punishment if we've received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It means an honor, reverence. It means a submission to God's will above our own. It means acknowledging that God is the God of the universe. He created all things, and he sets the standard. He decides what's right and wrong. And one of the signs of the last days is that we are going to see wickedness increase on the earth. The same with the days of Noah, right? They, they were doing whatever they wanted to do. It was very evident. It got very dark. And the same thing is happening again. We're seeing it in our culture today. And this is going to be one of the signs that someone really belongs to the Lord is that they have the fear of God and they believe that God sets the standard that we don't decide what's right and what's wrong. But then also, what do we see here? It says, by faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness. Okay, now to understand this, what it's saying here, we've got to look a little deeper. This is 2 Peter uh, 2, 1. It says, but false prophets also appeared among the people, just as there also... Uh, sorry, there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly in introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. This is verse four. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, held for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So what's it saying here that Noah was doing? He was preaching righteousness, right? But then you go back to Hebrews and it says, by faith, he condemned the world. Okay. What was Noah's job? It was twofold. It was to point people to the truth and to point people to salvation. So what was the truth? The truth was stop doing things your way and start doing things God's way, right? What was salvation? It was the ark itself. So even when you look as far back as Noah, listen, listen to this. You see the grace of God, even in this story, where, where we, would, we assume that it would be difficult to see, right? But Noah was warning them about the flood to, to come, right? Some people see Noah as a picture of Christ, right? Like a, a, a picture of the deliverer, but that's not necessarily true. Noah was actually a picture of the law itself because Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And he was saying, stop sinning, <laughs> do what's right, right? But it says by faith, he condemned the world through his preaching righteousness. And the word of God calls the old covenant through which the law came, the ministry of condemnation. See, what would have happened if somebody had repented and said, you're right, I believe. I believe that it's coming. I believe you're telling the truth. That's from God. We need to escape the sinful world. Listen, they would have, despite their sin, had a opportunity for salvation through the ark. Now, you can get into all the bloodline theology and all that kind of stuff, and I agree There's that would you know change that picture a little bit there, right? But when it comes to the picture of salvation and what God's doing on the earth today, you can be the dirtiest person on earth and you can repent and come to Jesus and find salvation in him. It can be even you got five seconds till your death and you turn and you repent and you believe in what Jesus did and God makes you righteous and you get to be with him in paradise. I mean, look at the thief on the cross. Also, look at what Jesus 
the parable he tells about, you know, the workers in the field where one was called at the, uh, you know, early in the day and the other one was called the last hour of the day. They both get paid the same amount, he says. And, and you know, the workers the, that worked all day got mad about it. You know, and some of us Christians, we get mad about that idea where we go, no, somebody can't repent in the last five seconds. God wouldn't give them that salvation. God wouldn't do that for them because he saw their whole life. Listen, Jesus would turn around and say to us the same thing that the master in that parable told to the workers who had been working all day long. It might, it, it's not your grace. It's my grace. Let me do with it what I want. I can save those people the same way I saved you. But I believe as the church, it's easy for us to write people off. But at the same time, a judgment is coming. But listen, God has not called us. He's called us to be preachers of righteousness. He's called us to be uh, deliverers of the gospel truth, pointing to salvation in Jesus Christ. But he has not called us to be the judge here and now. God is the judge, and that's coming. So we need to make sure that we're not crossing that line and doing something God hasn't asked us to do. Second Peter 2, 9. This is the same chapter. Now it's talking about Lot. It's talking about Noah, then talk about Lot. And then it says, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from a trial and to keep the unrighteous under, under punishment for the day of judgment. So he's saying people are not getting away with stuff the way they assume. And sometimes we as the church assume, man, God is blessing them even though they're living in sin, right? I don't get it. And I'm over here, like not getting any of that. You know, like I feel like I'm doing what God's telling me to do. And yet why are they, why is everything going their way? And the Lord is saying through this verse, it's not, it's not going their way. You keep doing what I've called you to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you why, how we get off track in that scripturally in a, in a little bit. Um, when I go through these heresies, okay, after these six heresies, Second Peter two nineteen says, promising them freedom while they were themselves, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. Corruption by what anyone is overcome by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become first or worse for them than the first. Sorry, I am. My brain is turned off today, so I'm having a hard time reading. Probably should have had a little caffeine before I started this, but it's all good. I don't need it. The Holy Spirit will, will help me. All right, so what is it saying here? Okay, so we could get into the whole once saved, always saved debate. Like, is is it scriptural? Is it not? This is this is this is what I've seen in scripture, y'all. Just this is my opinion. This is not the Holy Spirit saying this. Okay, this is just my opinion. There's good arguments for both sides. Okay, and when somebody goes so far into one side or the other that they're unwilling to even like listen to what the other side has to say about it, it's like I I, I believe that's a problem. Okay, now I lean towards one saved, always saved, but I have never met a someone I would consider a true believer who believes in once saved, always saved, that has ever used that to justify sin at all. And unfortunately, on the other side, a lot of times that becomes the argument. It's like, well, you're just just you're using you're using that to justify sin, and people are going to use that to justify sin. I've never seen anyone say that before. Okay. Now I know people do it, but I've never seen a good godly teacher teach that. So either way, <laughs> we need the fear of the Lord and we should not be living in sin. Okay, but can we have an assurance that we belong to the Lord? See, that's the real that's the real question. And I know I'm getting off track from these notes and stuff. But somebody needs to hear this. Today. That's the real question. Can you have a real assurance that you belong to the Lord? Yes, absolutely. The Holy Spirit is that assurance. The word actually calls him the down payment to our inheritance. If, if you're inheriting something, you legally have that inheritance coming your way. It's a legal transaction. It belongs to you, right? Even though you haven't received it yet, it's yours based on your status as a son or a daughter. Based on your status as an heir. Okay? And sometimes a down payment is given. And in this case, the Holy Spirit is that assurance. He is that down payment. So you can have assurance. 
Yet at the same time, I also believe, and it, and this is what I'm trying to explain what's happening here in Second Peter two nineteen, okay, and twenty. I also believe that there is a growth process of developing into a real faith, and there's a time period where someone can decide if they were really going to put their trust in Jesus, their faith in Jesus or not. They can hear the gospel. They can hear the truth. They can begin to understand it, but then they have an opportunity to either receive it in their heart and allow it to be planted or not. And I believe that that's what it's talking about here is people that have truly understood the gospel message and they've ultimately decided to reject it because they want what the world has to offer instead. Now, there can be debate about that. I don't have to be right. <laughs> but we need to take the full scripture into account when we're when we're coming up with our doctrines and our theology and all that kind of stuff. We're not supposed to be coming up with that stuff. It's supposed to be the scripture, and the Holy Spirit wants to help us. But we need to make sure we're not narrowing down to one specific point of view to the exclusion of scripture itself. Okay, here we go. This is the word I received, and all of this is going to, I believe God's going to wrap this up with these heresies after this word. This is what I received on November 27th. I heard the Lord say, let <laughs> wrap this up. Man, the, the first thing in this word is let's wrap this up together. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Okay, I heard the Lord say, let's wrap this up together. And in this case, he's talking about the, that's not a coincidence, y'all. But in this case, he's talking about the second coming. He's talking about the time we have left on the earth as Christians, right? And he says, I'm coming back soon, and I bring my reward in my hands. And I heard him say, yet those who are so focused on the timing often miss the purpose I have them here for. So he's saying the timing itself of his return can be a distraction. That's what he's saying. And then he said, don't miss what I have you here to do in your anxiousness to see me. And then he said, see me through the things I ask you to do for me while you are on this earth, because it's me doing the work through you anyway. What's he saying? He's saying, you don't have to wait. <laughs> you don't have to wait until Jesus returns to be intimate with him, to, to be close to him. The word says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. It says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If Jesus is living in you and he's doing the work through you, then you are in line for experiences and encounters with God. And more importantly than encounters themselves, you're in line for a nearness and an intimate fellowship with him, a friendship. See, sometimes people get in trouble for saying things like, we can have heaven here on earth, right? Because obviously, you know, that phrase taken too far is way out of context of what scripture is saying. But I get what they're trying to say a lot of the times. It's because they, they are walking so near with the Lord that it feels like they're in heaven already. It feels like there's no separation because in the spirit, there's not. I mean, what does Ephesians say? It says we're seated with him in, in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So in our spirit, there is no separation, even though we're still here separated by this earthly veil, this body, right? It's like, uh, have you ever read like a kid's book? <laughs> you know, a kid's Christian book where it says Jesus can, wants to be your friend, you know, like Jesus wants, and you see like Jesus walking around with this little kid or something like and holding hands or whatever, you know, the bullies are bullying them and Jesus is, standing there like protecting them or whatever you know it's like or or they they didn't have money for lunch but you know jesus somehow provides for them it's like but it's painting this picture of a friend who's with you right and some of us have grown up out of that idea to such an extent that we're not experiencing the intimacy that he actually wants for us as believers he has a friendship he has a friendship for us he wants to walk with us. When other people desert us, he wants to be there for us. When other people betray us, he will sit with us and help us and work 
through things with us. Now, does that mean we're having open-eyed visions of the Lord every single day? Probably not. You know, like maybe some people do. That's okay if someone really does, but it's not, we don't need it. As Christians, we don't need to see to believe. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. But we do need to believe. That's the point. We need to start believing that we have this fellowship with the Lord through the Holy Spirit. That he's right there. He's willing to listen. He's willing to speak to us because he is. And again, I'm going to get into a little bit more of that later. But the next thing I heard the Lord say is, so why not enjoy the time left busy working with the Holy Spirit to produce fruit that will last for eternity? Man, that's good. Someone needs to hear that today. I need to hear that. Why not enjoy the time left? Busy working with the Holy Spirit to produce fruit that will last for eternity. And some people will say, no, we're not supposed to be enjoying this life. But what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, joy, joy. You know, some people would say, well, it's not about feelings. It's hard to get around the idea that we're, that, you know, like that we're not, that we're supposed to feel joy from the Lord. I mean, like joy mostly is a feeling. Some people say, no, it's it's not a feeling. It's it's like this state of tranquility or something. It's like, no, you're describing the peace of God. You're describing being at peace with God. Joy is an experience, and it's a lot of times it's an emotional experience. It's there, you know, there's a little bit more to it than that, but it, there's not a lot more. It's like his heart being shared with you. And what is it wrapped up in? Is it wrapped up in getting all the things we want? No. That's not where Jesus got his joy from. It says he endured the cross because of the joy set before him. The joy was those he was going to spend eternity with. That's where our joy comes from. So when we have encounters with the Lord, we should expect joy. But listen, even if we're not having an encounter, we should have joy anyways. Why? Because we're already seated with him in heavenly places. And by faith, we know. Yeah, he's there. We know he's with us. I heard the Lord say this. He said, as you reach out, I will show you the plan I have for your life. So now God's getting more specific. And yes, many people know we are we are meant to be working, right? We're, we're meant to be the wise servant, you know, while awaiting the master's return, doing what he's asked us to do. But the question a lot of times is, well, Lord, but what have you asked me to do, Right. And the Lord said, as you reach out, I will show you the plan I have for your life, the specific plan. I won't give it all at once, but I will reveal the little parts that are necessary for you to be able to take that next step of faith in my kingdom purpose for you. Now, for some people, he may give a larger portion of the plan, right? But for most believers, this is what God does. And this is what I heard him say, but this is what this is what he does. Hey, here's the next step. Even prophecy is like that. You know, sometimes people get mad and they're like, well, why don't you just give me the full message? It's like, I gave you everything I heard. <laughs> what I heard was a small part of the full picture, right? We prophesy in part, the word says. A lot of times God will say, hey, take this step. And we're like, but Lord, what, if I take that step, what, you know, I have no assurance. And, and the Lord's like, I am your assurance. It's, it's, it's coming down to, do we really trust what the Lord is saying or not? Do we really trust what his word has said? I mean, that's why he says, my word is a light to your feet, a lamp to your path. You know, sometimes we have to say, I don't know what's coming next, but I know this is what God's word has said, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep seeking the Lord. You know, many people have asked me like, well, why do you think you can hear from God so often? It's like, I don't know. I don't know why he speaks to me as often as he, as he does. He just does. And listen, it didn't come out of me asking God for words every day. It didn't come out of me saying, God, please give me visions and dreams, you know, and like going somewhere to meet with somebody who teaches this stuff. It just came when I started seeking the Lord daily and saying, Jesus, I want more of your presence in my life. And I'm going to worship you every single day. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to spend time with you because I want to know you. And then God was like, okay, now this is what I'm doing in your life. And I'm like, well, now not to do it would be disobedience because <laughs> I know this is from God. But a lot of times we're we're looking for the full picture. We're looking for the full path. And God's given us the next step. If you don't know what the next step is, just seek the Lord with your whole heart. 
When you seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Nothing bad is going to come from finding him. God has promised that when we seek him with our whole hearts, we'll find him. There's nothing bad that's going to come from finding him. If you, if you need a uh, assurance of that, Luke 11, 9 through 13. It's, uh, it's right there. Okay. I heard the Lord say this next. He said, friendship with the world is stopping many of my people from being able to handle what I have for them. They are missing out on a great calling because they are unwilling to let go of the trappings that still have a hold on them. So, y'all, I know the Lord's not speaking this in anger today. He's speaking this with love and with grace. But I believe this is a blunt truth as well. And this is not something that anyone is immune from. <laughs> we all have this issue at one point or another. There's things that we are unwilling to let go of. See, God has called us as believers to be in the world, but not of the world. You know, Jesus told his disciples that he would be with them always, even to the end of the age. A lot of times it comes down to that simple question. Do I want the nearness of Christ today or do I want what this thing is promising me that I can have? No, Jesus' nearness is not based on our sacrifice. That's not what I'm saying. So please don't hear that. See, some Christians believe that. They're like, okay, the better you are, you know, the closer to God that you'll be, the the more you sacrifice, the more you give, the more time you spend reading, the, you know, the, the, the more access you have to God. It's really not the case. It's really not true. Where does our access to God come from? It comes from what Jesus did for us on the cross, and it's his grace, and it's our faith. See, but the truth is real faith, real belief, that we have access always leads to action. It always leads to pursuit. That's the test of whether it's real faith or not. But there's some people that do a lot of the actions and they never get any closer to God. It's because they're not doing it in faith. They're doing it to try to earn something, to try to please God. When they have forgotten, hey, it wasn't, I could never please him. It was what Jesus did at the cross that pleased God for me. That's what that's what earned the righteousness of God for me. It's a free gift from Jesus. Listen, but when we stop and we look at that and we say, I want that, I want that nearness. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be walking hand in hand with my Savior. I want to be in, in, in close proximity with Him, as, as close to Him as I can be. But then by faith, we believe Jesus' sacrifice is enough. And I'm going to take advantage of that every day. And that faith is going to drive us to pursue Him. It's going to drive us to, to make that decision because we know, listen, deep down, we know as believers that if we really, you know, if, if, you, if you really love someone, you're going to pursue them. You're going to spend time with them. We know that if we really spend time with the Lord, we're going to have a greater experience with the Lord. So the Lord is, is calling, he's, he's calling us right now to let go of the things that are stopping that from happening. That's not everything. That doesn't mean like go be a hermit somewhere. That's not what God is saying. But if there's something that the Holy Spirit brings to our minds, see, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's why it says that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Because at some point, the Holy Spirit's going to be the one that says, hey, this thing is not good for you anymore. Or he's going to say, hey, this thing is not good for you for this season. He's going to y'all, there have been times where the Lord said, take a month off from some, you know, something like caffeine or something like that. And he's like, don't, you don't need that for a month, you know? And in that, that, that spot, I have an opportunity to respond in faith and say, okay, if you say that, then I don't need it. Right. And God's going to give me something better. And I believe that a, a near more, a nearness to the Lord is going to come out of that. The, I heard the Lord say this. He said, I'm giving you the secret to freedom. And then he said, just get into my presence in the secret and quiet place and let loose, let go. Get alone with me and say, here I am, Lord, have my all, have my worship, have my time, have my freedom even in my life. See, that's why Paul calls us bond servants of Christ. A bond servant is someone who, 
were, were was not a servant. They were free. And yet because of their love for a master, they've decided to put themselves under that person's authority and to serve them with their life. That's, that's what the love of Christ empowers us to do, to become a bondservant of Christ. To say, I was a slave to sin, but now I am a slave to righteousness. Now, now I am a servant of God. And what's amazing about that is Jesus doesn't call us servants anymore. He calls us friends. And yet, out of that place of love, it's like we can't help but serve. You know, like that is, that's, our, that's our role, but it's, it's, it's a love-based role service it's it's one friend serving someone that that they they love more than anything in the world i heard the lord say this next he said when you're able to do that with me he's talking about this surrendering and it's coming into the presence of god uh this uh going to the secret place right with the lord pursuing him that's what he's talking about he says when you're able to do that with me that is when you truly begin to find those things. So he's saying anything that the Holy Spirit asks you to surrender is like you're truly you're going to start finding real fulfillment, you know, and real life in Him as you begin to surrender those things. And he said that is when life truly begins to make sense because you were designed for that, for a letting go kind of life, for a life of surrender rooted in my grace and love that I have poured out for you. See, our surrender, I'm going to stop and say this and then read the rest of this, but our surrender is not based in our trying to earn something or get something from God. Our surrender is a response to what Jesus has done for us. It's, it's just the love of the Father overflowing out of our hearts. But to be able to do that, you have to be full of his love. You got to receive it. You got you to look at what Jesus did. You got to meditate on what Jesus did. You got to think about it. Sing about it, pray about it, talk about it. Some people listening, you need to write about it. The Lord is saying for some people, and I believe the Holy Spirit's going to confirm if this is for you. He's saying, write about that testimony that you have that you've been keeping inside. Write it down. Let people know about that, what I've done for you. But the Lord said this next. He said, find freedom in me by transferring your hopes and dreams into my hands. At first, it will feel like a sacrifice, and then it will feel like freedom. When you know the person who loves you most is making the next move on your behalf, when he's taking the next step for you, when we're surrendering to the Lord, it's like sitting in the passenger seat and giving him, you know, people say, take the wheel, Jesus, that, like that overused phrase. But that's really what's happening when we surrender is that God starts to make decisions and we go, yep, okay, no problem. You know, it's like every time it's like, yep, even if it sounds crazy to our natural mind, even if it sounds like a big sacrifice, it's not. It's just the Lord leading. And we know that where, wherever he's leading us is a good place to go. So I hope you all can receive that word. Uh, and I hope that that lands with grace, with love, with gentleness. Um, but the last video where I shared, I, it, it's, uh, I believe the title of the video is like what God told me about the rapture in this winter. So again, that was not a rapture date prediction, but it was two words that I got. One that had to do with the winter time, one that had to do with the rapture itself. And the Lord asked me to put them together. So I did. But if you haven't watched that video, um, um, if, if, whether you have or not, many people talked about in the comments uh, for, on that one that was back in September, the, the parable of the 10 virgins, right? Where there's five foolish virgins and five wise. And the wise ones had the oil in their lamp for when the bridegroom was coming. That might have been, I might have talked about it a little bit. I don't know if that was the video where I couldn't think of the word bridegroom, but there was a live stream recently where I was like, trying to think of this word and i was like the guy who comes back in the parable and like he's like not the bride but the i was like could not anyways bride and groom at least i'm able to think of that word today but um i'm gonna address some of those questions here real quick and then move on to these destructive heresies is that parable talking about the rapture? Or is it talking about the return of Christ and the start of the millennial reign? I don't know. <laughs> There's debate about it. There's debate, uh, you know, even between scholars about that. Do we need to know? Like, can the Holy Spirit, as you read that, reveal exactly what he's saying there? Yes, because he's the interpreter of the scriptures. But if he hasn't revealed that to you yet, that's okay. You can know what the parable is teaching nonetheless. Okay. 
uh, it's not teaching this. Okay. And this is a fear that comes up. And I've, I've heard people in charismatic circles more often than others teach this, where it's just, I, it's only, they don't go so far as to say it usually, but it, it leads people into thinking, if I don't have enough oil in my lamp, then I'm going to get left behind. And it's this idea of not, not knowing the Lord is it's not not being saved but it's it's this idea of well I didn't pray enough today I didn't read the Bible enough today I didn't worship enough I didn't spend enough time with Jesus so maybe maybe I'm going to be one of those foolish virgin virgins when he returns and I'm going to get left behind right because I didn't have enough oil you know and a lot of times in charismatic circles when someone talks about the oil there you know it, it it's it brings up thoughts of like the glory of God the tangible presence of God, which is very real. It occurs in services. It occurs even in live streams like this, you know, where it's like the presence of God will just come and, and rest on something, right? Or on, on people. And uh, in a lot of charismatic circles, that is what we equate with the oil, right? Is And so we look at verses like this and we potentially have that thought, okay, if I didn't do enough today, Maybe I'm not one of the wise versions and maybe I will be left behind, right? And listen to me, that is not what this passage is teaching, okay? It's not what it's saying. Why do I know that? Because that's not scriptural. That's not biblical. It's We have to look at one parable and one passage through the lens of the entire Bible. And if the entire scripture does not teach that, then we can know that that's not what that scripture is saying. In fact, the scripture teaches the opposite, right? Where does our justification come from? Christ alone. It comes from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and our believing in what he did for us. Justif justification by faith, not by oil in our lamps, right? Not by the amount of oil. But at the same time, what is it saying here? Okay. There's two different warnings that I believe this parable is giving. Number one is to the unbeliever. The first warning to those who are in the church. So you've got these 10 virgins, right? And I believe it can, it can be saying there are people in the church who they, like second Peter was saying, they've heard the message, right? But they've yet to believe it. And because of that, they have no oil in their lamps. And, the, and eventually the time runs out. That grace period runs out eventually. So there's, it's a warning to those who call themselves a Christian. They attend church. They do the Bible study thing. They do the home group thing. They, they do the church life, but they don't have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. They're saying eventually that grace period is going to run out. It's time to make a decision. It's time to give your life to Jesus. It's time to fully believe in what he's done. Number two, it's an appeal to believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit as they await the return. The word says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. And the original language there is talking about being feel, filled. But continue to be filled. is That's what the original language is saying there. Continue to be filled with the Spirit. As Christians, we have an opportunity to walk in the fullness of all that God has for us here and now as we await His return. But it takes being filled with the Spirit to do that. Why? Jesus said, if you believe in me, you know, those who believe in me, they will do what I've been doing. They will do even greater things than these. How on earth are we supposed to do that, Jesus? The only way is if the Holy Spirit is the one doing it through us. It's the only way. So the word of God is appealing to us. This parable appealing to Christians. Be filled with the Spirit daily. Have fresh oil. I can't say that phrase without thinking of Chris Garcia's fresh oil. <laughs> A live stream that he does. Okay, so here's some destructive heresies, okay? I heard this today. The Lord said, this is why I'm talking about this. The Lord said, break down the destructive heresies. This is what I this is what I have for you to do. Something critical is taking place upon the earth during this season. He said, and I am setting up my body for success, not failure. 
But then I heard, but part of that preparation involves destroying the destructive, the destructive heresies that have plagued her thus far, removing her, uh, sorry, removing from her midst the parts of Christianity that have not originated with me. This is what I, this is what I heard the Lord say earlier today. This I'm going to go back and reference this verse. Second Peter two one it says, but false prophets also appeared among the people. He's actually talking about uh, the end times, talking about what we're supposed to be doing, right? until the Lord's return. And, and that's the that's the context of this passage. It's talking about Jesus' second coming. And he says, but false prophets also appeared among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Okay, this is a warning to us. And he says, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Okay, so we're being warned of destructive heresies here. Now, there's a difference between damnable heresies, and I'm sorry for using that word, but that's the best one I can think of right now. But <laughs> those kind of heresies that are condemning, that will keep someone from salvation, and minor heresies. Now, some, some, somebody may say I'm a heretic just for saying that, but I'm going to explain what I mean in a minute. And we've taken in the church, we've taken the word heresy and we've made it mean something that it doesn't actually mean. So this is the definition. I looked up heresy, okay? A belief or opinion contrary to orthodox doctrine. A belief or opinion contrary to orthodox doctrine. So there are non-negotiables. That would be the, the, you know, if you got that wrong, that is a heresy that would keep somebody out of fellowship with the Lord, right? And there are negotiables. There are the non-essentials, that essentials versus non-essentials, right? There are major heresies, and I'm going to go through those, just three of them very quickly. There's more than this, but most people listening already know these. Most people listening are not believing these lies, so I don't have to worry about that. But, and then I'm going to go through some, and here's, and this is where the focus is, is, is on the non-essential ones, and it's on the the heresies which are simply in this case teachings that are not doctrinally true from scripture and i know there's the doctrine of man then there's the doctrine of god which is what the word of god actually says but these are teachings that go against the word of god and yet they don't keep you out of heaven okay now some people say well how is that true well listen listen my friend if you think you have to have everything theologically perfect to get into heaven number one you're rejecting justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ because you're saying you have to have everything perfectly correct in your mind to, you know, to be saved. But number two, you also, if that were true, nobody would make it because <laughs> everybody's wrong on some something, right? Everyone is, we're all still in process of the Lord teaching us what the truth is in all the different areas of our life. So there's nobody that's gotten everything right. We're all in a growth process yet. We should be sure that we're right about the essentials, okay? So these are three truths. So instead of giving you the heresy itself in the in the lie, I'm going to give you the truth that fights against the, these major heresies, okay? Number one, this is the first truth. If I can get this to appear on the screen, yeah. Number one, people are not intrinsically good, okay? One of the heresies that it will keep people from being saved is that sin is not a problem. When someone says, oh, there's no such thing as sin, or no, sin's not an issue, God's not worried about that anymore, or no, people are basically good, and Jesus helps us, but he, but we don't really need him because we're, we've got it, you know, it's like, we've, we're have we basically already good, we're, we just need, you know, a little bit of like polishing, that's a heresy, right? It's, scripture does not teach that, Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is no righteous person, not even one, okay, so no one's, no one's good <laughs> after the fall of man. We're all born into sin. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay? We all need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So, number two. The Bible is the authoritative word of God. Now, there's a lot of different scriptures I could quote to, to show this, right? But someone who would oppose this message or this truth would say, well, that's just circular reasoning, right? If you're using scripture to prove scripture, if that scripture is true, then that's circular reasoning. And I would say, you're right. <laughs> the, 
That is circular reasoning. So I'm not going to do that. But how do you know that the Bible is God's written word to us? How do you know it's authoritative, right? This is how you know, is that you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who confirms it to you. I had to do this at one point, y'all. And this, maybe I'm sharing too much here. Maybe I'm sharing too much. But I did get to the point in my Christian walk where I, where, you know, the word says, if anyone adds to the book of this law, you know, to this word, like um, they're going to be condemned, right? Or, or they're going to be cursed, right? Or, uh, you know, all scripture is profitable for teaching, rebuking, you know, and training in righteousness. It's like, but how do you know what all scripture is? How do you know what we're supposed to consider the word of God? How do you know what it is? You know, the Holy Spirit's the one. This is 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. This is why it's not up for debate. And it says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Holy Spirit decided what Scripture was. Okay? So if you want to look at it from a historical perspective, the, the history of the church, the, you know, the, the uh, founding fathers, in a sense, of the church, the, uh, some of the early leaders, and you want to look at it through church history, you want to look at it through even the history of the, the Bible being um, preserved throughout history and, and, and complete and accurate more than any other book in history. If you want to look at all those things, that's great, and that's evidence for it being the Word of God. But deep down, you have to have the Holy Spirit being the one saying, this is my written word. This is it. Now, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you might hear some, some sort of wacko thing. <laughs> you know, like you might, but that is why consistently most throughout most of church history, most of the church has believed what that's the, the word of God is what the word of God is. It's because they've had the Holy Spirit. And he's always going to point us to God's written revelation for us when we're asking for that. When we're saying, Holy Spirit, what, what should I consider the word of God? And some people are going to feel uncomfortable with me even saying prayers like that out loud, right? But listen, this is why we're losing the younger generation in the church in some cases. It's because we're afraid of speaking. In some cases, some of us are afraid of speaking real Questions out loud that we should be asking God. Questions that we should be bringing to the Lord. Questions that we should be encouraging the young people to bring to the Lord. Because when 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 they start when they haven't found Him themselves yet, and they start having these questions, right? And what we would call doubts, and we're like, no, 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 don't say that. That's a doubt. Don't say that. You know, it's like, no, you need to say that to the Lord. You need to take it to Him. God's going to answer that question for you. Why should you believe that the Bible is true and is authoritative? Let God answer that question for you. He wants to. <laughs> God is the one that has to answer that question for you. Now, you can share your testimony. You can share what God's done through the word for you. All those things are going to point them back to Jesus Christ, but they have to meet him for them, themselves. They can meet him in the scripture. Reading the word of God, I did. But... When it comes to the authority, the authority of the, of the written word, they have to have that revelation for themselves. And that revelation only comes through the Holy Spirit. Okay, but we have this. This is a heresy nowadays where people will say, well, you know, the Bible is a religious text, but all the religious texts are good. And, you know, you need to like, uh, what is truth? You know, they'll ask that question. And, and this is, is that it's a heresy, right? Okay, this is the third one. This is the third truth that's fighting against a major heresy. Jesus is the only way to God. This is the truth. Jesus is the only way. The heresy today is, well, there's all these different religions. There's always different Christian leaders, and there's many different ways to God. You know, most people have heard that. Most people listening to this stream do not have a problem with this. You know that Jesus is the only way, right? But some people may not know that. Acts 4, 10 through uh, uh, 12 says, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. 
He is the stone which was rejected to you, uh, rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. Saying he's the only way. Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So these are major heresies. These are three examples. There's a lot of them, okay? Now I'm going to address some minor ones, okay? Some minor heresies. heresies. And why am I doing this, okay? I, heard, I, I got this impression today after I heard that word about the Lord saying, to break down or tear down. Wait, what did, he, what did he say exactly? Let me read it. Break down the destructive heresies, okay? Which is, destructive heresies is a phrase from uh, 2 Peter 2, 1, okay? I got this impression from the Lord. Sometimes it's not even a, a, a damnable heresy. Sometimes it's a, only a fraction off. It's something that they ha- that's theologically incorrect, but it's a real problem that's causing the church, in some cases, to lose their center, which should be Christ. So, so I'm just going to give three, okay? A lot of times the major ones are not the issue. You know, for those who really are saved, they're not. But the minor, the minor issues can cause a bigger problem. This is number one. This is a truth that fights against a heretical teaching in the church, okay? The, the truth is that the word never promises that every believer will, will be financially rich in this life. He just doesn't. Now, I am all for financial blessing. I am all for the blessing of the Lord. It says that all of God's promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus for us who believe. It even goes, it talks about the boundless riches of his grace that will be revealed to us in the age to come, in, in this age what the, that we are living in under the new covenant. But does that include financial wealth on this side of heaven? Not always. It doesn't. And I'm going to show you in Scripture, and there's no arguing with this. 1 Timothy 6, 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. See, the problem is there's a teaching in the church that would argue against what Paul just said to Timothy here. Let's we'll say, Paul, no, you're not living by faith if you're content with those things. You shouldn't be content with that. And here's the problem with that teaching. The teaching itself is causing people to lose their contentment and is causing people to lose their joy and it's taking people's eyes off of the purpose that God has us here to accomplish. Look at this. Look at this verse, okay? The Lord reminded me of this right before. Y'all, and please hear this from this context, okay? This, this book, Stop Worrying, there's a chapter in here called Stop Worrying About Money. And I talk all about the blessing of the Lord. And I share several financial like miracles that God did in my life, has done in me and my wife's lives in this book. So I believe in that. I, got, I believe in supernatural provision. Okay. But this is what we, we, you know, like I said earlier, we can't go so far into one verse in scripture and take it so far out of context that we, divorce it from the rest of scripture okay we have to take the full scripture into account first timothy 6 9 those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction what was what was the the phrase from second uh timothy 2 1 that these these false teachers will secretly introduce destructive heresies Listen, this is not a heresy. Believing that every Christian needs to be rich, and then if you're not rich, somehow you're failing God, or you're not pleasing God, or you're not doing something right. Believing that is not a damnable heresy. It's not. And I I even have friends who have gone so far as to use that phrase, like, well, that's another damnable heresy, right? Like, that that is, and this is, and this is. It's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. That It's something that they're off on. But that is, that is not going to keep them from heaven, right? If, they're, if they are really trusting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's something that they're wrong about. It's something that is going to cause destruction in their life. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a relationship with God, right? But look at it. It says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. It's like a snowball effect, right? If we as the church don't get over this, it's it's going to lead into more ruin and destruction in the long run. We don't have to be rich. Listen, 
I, I just hear the Lord saying this right now. This is a word for some, for somebody listening. The Lord is saying, I have freedom for you. And that freedom is found in my contentment that I, I want you to rest in. And the Lord is saying, and especially in this season, I'm going to be sharing contentment with my people. I'm going to be, be teaching contentment to my people in a fresh and new way. I Man, I just hear the, the Holy Spirit saying this. I want you to be content. There's so much joy there. I want you to be content. That's what God wants for us. Y'all, so many of us have focused on riches and fi financial gain and everything and wealth for so long that we, we, we don't even understand how much joy can be found in just being content with what we have. Just, be, just being glad that Jesus died for us and saying, that's good enough for me. Like suddenly what happens is in that space, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal the joy to us in all the little areas of life. Even if it's just, man, I've got food to eat and I've got clothing on, my, clothing on my back, like Paul said. Like if I have those things, I'm content. God, you know. A desire, like First Timothy 6, 9 says, those who want to get rich, that constant desire for more wealth and to get rich, right? It sucks the joy out of life because it keeps promising like, well, you'll have joy. You'll have, you know, fulfillment. Once you get these things, it sucks all of the joy out of life. But contentment brings the joy back. Look at First Timothy 6, 17. This is another verse that shows that not every believer will be financially wealthy in this, this side of heaven. It says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. They're saying we can enjoy all things. He doesn't say just the rich ones are going to be enjoying all things. He says, no, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy, all things that we need. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So God does promise supernatural provision, but he does not promise supernatural financial riches. There's a difference. Now, does he make some Christians rich? Yes. Maybe he's called you to be rich. Maybe he has. Okay. But if, listen. But if you're but if you're still if you're constantly trying to get rich or you're constantly setting your hope on the uncertainty of riches, there's a problem. It says instruct those who are rich, meaning some people are not. You see, that's going to be the norm. There's going to be some people that have a lot of money, some people don't. It doesn't matter. We can all have contentment and we can all be richly supplied with everything that we need and we can enjoy what we have. This is a minor heresy in the church, not a major heresy. But it is something that can cause destruction in the long run if we don't, if we, if the Lord is not allowed to come in and to heal this. Okay. This is the next one. The next truth. And these are just three. There's so many of these. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to be pointing these out to people today. Maybe later today, as you go about your business, the Lord might bring something to your mind. I hope he brings something to my mind because I like I constantly want the Lord to be leading me more into more and more truth. The amazing thing is he doesn't do it and say, Oh, you, you know, he doesn't slap us in the back of the head. <laughs> he says, Hey. This is going to hurt you. Come over here. And if we trust him, we can say, wow, thank you. Yes. Awesome. Like, I'm so glad that I know that now. I'm so glad that you brought me back over here. Okay. So this is the next one. This is the next truth that fights against a minor heresy and is that good things are not always a reward for good behavior. See, there's a belief in many places in the church that if something good is happening to you, that means you're doing the right thing. If something bad is happening to you, that means you're doing the wrong thing. You know, it's it's bled over into healing ministries to the extent that some healing ministries believe if you're sick, it's always because of personal sin. It's not the truth. Now, sometimes it could be related, but what does the word say? It says Jesus became the curse for us. It says that he took the curse of the law upon himself. So when it comes to something like healing, we can believe. Should we believe that God, the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us, that he's going to point out sin in our lives, that he's going to help us to walk in righteousness? Absolutely. But do we have to never, ever make a mistake in order to, to, to believe God for healing and for, for health in this life? No. 
We can believe for those things because of what Jesus did. I mean, what does David write in the Psalms? You know, that God uh, cleanses me for or, or forgives me of all my iniquity and heals all my diseases. It's the same God that does both these things. It's by his grace. Now, does that mean that we nothing ever goes wrong, right, in this life? No, not necessarily. I'm going to show you that, okay? You know, I mean, Job is an amazing example of this. But John 16, 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. He's saying, hey, you're going to have tribulation in this life. There's going to be trials. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be persecutions. But he, what is he promising? you got to look at the promise that's actually in here. It's it's not that everything's going to go our way. It's so that it says, in me, you may have peace. He's saying, you can have peace through the midst of these things, and you're going to have my presence through the midst of these things. And you, and you can have courage because I've already overcome all of this. This is temporary light afflictions, as Paul said. Not even worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And Paul was going through hell on earth <laughs> in some cases. You know, Paul was going through the worst of the worst. And he calls it light, light temporary afflictions because he knew the God that was with him. Matthew 5, 44 through 45, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Well, look at this. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Man, we need to get over this idea that, well, that person's blessed, so they, they must be doing everything right, right? And I'm, or, or I didn't get this thing that I wanted, so I must have done something wrong, you know, or I didn't get this thing I prayed for, so I must have done something wrong. It's not necessarily the case. And some people would say, would push back with like, well, what about like the book of Proverbs, right? You know, it talks about um, good things following those who do the right thing, bad things following those who do the wrong thing, you know, like in all sorts of different verses in Proverbs. Proverbs is speaking generally. It's saying, hey, if you live this way, generally this is going to happen. If you live that way, generally that's going to happen. That's going to be the, the consequence, the result. It's speaking generally. But again, we have to take the full context of Scripture into consideration. James 1, 2 through 3 says, Consider it all joy, my, uh, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So we're going to walk through hard times, even if we're doing everything right. And just because somebody is being looks like they're being blessed, it looks like they have everything they want, that doesn't mean they're pleasing to the Lord. You know, the psalmist writes about that. I believe it, it, I believe it's the psalm of, of Asaph, but I could be wrong about that. But he writes about how, man, like I was envious of the wicked. And then you get to the end of the psalm and you realize that the answer was, he goes, until I came into the presence of the Lord, then I saw their end. We should not be envious of those that God is sending rain upon. And it seems like the sun is rising upon. This is, this is the third one. This is, a, this is another truth that fights against a minor heresy today. You don't lose your righteous standing with God every time you sin. So I believe there are genuine... Christians who really know the Lord, who have this belief, whether it's uh, you know a conscious belief or a subconscious belief, and it's a subtle thing that has just worked its way into their frame of reference, that they have this belief that every single time that they make a mistake and they sin, they become unrighteous and they lose access to God. Now, I believe a belief like this can come from a major heresy. And can stem from that, and can be uh, evidence that something wor something worse is off track, right? More is off track than just this. But I also believe that true believers can have this wrong and can be constantly living in a place of fear based on this wrong belief. Because the truth is, you don't lose your righteous standing with God every time you sin. You don't. I'm going to show you this in Scripture, and then uh, and then I'm going to be done. I don't even know what time it is. What time is it? Oh, okay. I've been going for a while. So yeah. This is, this is going to be the last thing. <laughs> I'm not even paying attention, attention to the comments. Sorry, y'all. I'm not even. I'm not even uh... All right. 
my brain is all over the place today, but the Lord, the Lord is still good. He still knows what he's doing. Here's what's so amazing about it. When you don't lose your righteousness, even when you make a mistake, you don't lose your access because God is holy. God is and holiness. You know, one of the main definitions is separate, separate. He is separate from anything that's sinful. Okay. He is, and we are holy. We are called apart. We're called to be separate, right? We're called to be holy as he is holy. But listen, you don't lose your righteousness and your righteous standing with God and your position with him when you make a mistake. If you believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't. Okay. Romans 3, 20 through 22. And the good news is when you don't lose that, you don't lose your fellowship with him either. You don't lose your access to him. It says, because by the works of the law, none of mankind will be justified in his sight. So he's saying the law, doing everything perfectly, and following all the rules, can't justify you, essentially. And he says, for through the law comes knowledge of sin. Saying, when you know the law, you know the righteous standard? Yeah. You know, then, you know, and there's, there's, there's a difference between the law under the old covenant and the law now. It says, the old covenant, the law was the law of Moses. We can go and read those commandments in the scripture. But it says, now the law has been written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit, is what Hebrews says. Okay? But essentially, it's the same. God never changes yesterday, today, and forever. It's God's holy standard. Now, there's a difference between what we have to do ceremonially now as Christians versus what the Hebrews had to do, you know, under the old covenant. There's a big difference there. But something that is intrinsically sinful then is still intrinsically sinful now. Okay? what's what's right and wrong is still right and wrong okay and then look at this verse 21 so god's standard does sh reveal sin in our lives right that's essentially what i'm trying to say from this verse verse 21 but now apart from the law meaning apart from doing everything right the righteousness of god has been revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets meaning they they were all pointing up to this moment when jesus came and died Verse 22, but it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who do everything right? No. For all those who never make a mistake? No. For all those who believe, it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So listen, if it was righteousness that you received by faith in what Jesus did to start with, then why does your access to God's righteousness, why does that change now that you've made a mistake? It doesn't. You still have righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. It's still for all who believe in him. Okay. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is this saying? Okay. It's saying we're justified by faith in what Jesus did, by believing what he did. And he says, because of that, we have peace. So you don't lose these peace with God. It means you have a righteous standing before God. Like you have access with him. You, you are pleasing to God in his sight. When he sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Listen, that's the believer's rest, Hebrews chapter four. What does that mean? We have peace with God. We can rest. We can finally rest and say, wow, Jesus did it all. I can rest and I can know that God is pleased with me, not because I've done everything right, but because of what Jesus did. Hebrews 7, 19. Now you're going to start seeing how because we have this righteousness based on faith in Jesus, we have constant access, okay? And this is fighting against this minor heresy in the church that every time you make a mistake, you lose access to God and maybe even lose your salvation. Like, so that's what some people believe. It's like, oh, well, I sinned today and I better repent, you know? So just in case I die, you know, I, I don't go to hell, you know, or something like that. It's like, where, where are you finding that? Like, like that's not scriptural. It's not biblical. And it's heresy. It is a minor heresy. It's not going to keep you from salvation, but it's wrong. And we need to correct it. We need to come over to what scripture says. Because why? Because th th these are destructive heresies. They're things that are going to bring a lot of destruction. And I've seen how ministries will take up this way of viewing things. This, this, they'll, they'll think that this is true. And they'll start teaching this. And it's destroying a lot of people's lives. It's bringing a lot of bitterness against god to a lot of people it's bringing a lot of fear a lot of condemnation when we were not called to the ministry of condemnation we're called to the ministry of reconciliation reconciliation means being able to be friends with god again why can why why can we always be friends with god as christians it's because the sacrifice was paid once and for all that's why i'll show you that right here hebrews seven nineteen. 
It says, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the introduction of a better hope through which we come near to God. So saying through this better hope, through the new covenant, through what Jesus did, we are able to come near to God. Verse 25, therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him. Wow, do you hear that? He is able to save forever those who come to God through him. So why do why are people walking around afraid that they're going to lose their salvation? It's because they're not coming to God through Jesus. They're coming, they think that they're coming to God through their righteous works. They think they're coming to God through what they're doing for him. Listen, and even I know there's true Christians who really are saved who get sidetracked by this belief. Okay. I'm not saying that they're not saved. But it says, therefore, he is able to save forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Why, why does that? Why is that important that Jesus always lives to make intercession for, for us? Why is that important? It shows us why it's important right here. It's because of what is with him in heaven. Verse 26, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who has no daily need like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because he did this once for all time when he offered up himself. The word says that Jesus, when he ascended into heaven after raising from the dead, he he went into the throne room and he offered his own blood as the sacrifice that would cover the sins of all those who would come to him. So why is it important that he always lives to make intercession for us? Is because when the devil comes in to accuse us, the accuser of the brethren, Jesus says, nope, my blood is still there. It's still on the altar. It's still on the mercy seat. And it's still speaking reconciliation for them. It's still speaking justification over them. It's still speaking forgiveness for them. We are under a better covenant, y'all. We're under a better covenant. And this heresy that says that every time you sin, you lose your access to God, you lose your fellowship with God, or even worse, you lose your salvation. Listen, it comes from an old covenant mindset. It comes from taking part of the scripture, part of the word of God, and running with that without looking at the full picture of what the New Testament says. Man, the, the, the book of Hebrews would break this mindset down in, in, in no time. But, but I think, you know, oftentimes it's so easy to read the stories in the Old Testament and go, well, this person did this, and then this happened to them. So I better not do that or else that'll happen to me, right? Instead of looking at the theology that's clearly laid out in the New, in the new Covenant, in the New Testament. And now it does take reading it. It does take saying, Holy Spirit, help me to understand this. But it's right there. It says he did this once for all time when he offered up himself. Did what? He offered a sacrifice that covered the sins of the people. That's what it's talking about. The, the high priests on earth, they had to offer those sacrifices all the time. There was a daily need for that. But it wasn't saying there's no daily need now. Because Jesus did this once for all time. He offered a sacrifice that covered our sins for all time. For all those who believe in him. Look at this, Hebrews 8, 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which he has enacted on better promises. So much better, y'all, than it was. So much better under the new covenant. And then look at verse 12. Look at the results of this, okay? What do we get out of this? Verse 12, the father says, for I will be merciful toward their wrongdoings and their sins I will no longer remember. Are there real consequences for bad decisions here on earth? Yes. But when you are believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're trusting what he did for you on the cross, and you come to the Father and you say, I made this huge mistake. What what does God say? The Holy Spirit comes and he says, I see you as righteous because of what Jesus did for you. And he reminds us that your sins are covered by the blood, and I actually don't even remember them. I choose not to remember them anymore. And for some people, the Holy Spirit is asking this question today. So why are you running away? 
Why do you think I'll say anything other than this right here? If you just come to me, just bring those things to me. I hear the Lord saying, you don't need to run away any longer. Some of us are running and we're in church every Sunday. Some of us are running from fellowship with the Holy Spirit and we're reading the Bible every day. We're running and we're doing our devotional time. We're running and we're playing worship music and Christian music in the car. But we're running from intimacy with the Lord because we don't want to have to have this discussion with him. Because we're afraid of what he'll say. We don't want our sins to come to light. But when you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you bring your sins out into the light and you allow, and you, and you say, Lord, and you be honest, you say, Lord, this is what this is what I've done, and I am sorry. Then your hands are open to receive the love and the grace of God in that moment. And that's what he's going to give you. The Lord, and the Lord is going to say, This is why I died for you, so that I could cover that. You don't need to be bound by that any longer. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to cover that up any longer. Just give it to me and get set free today. I hear the Lord saying this, find freedom in what my son has done for you. Ephesians 3.12 says, In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Hey, I'm live streaming. <laughs> My wife is busting in on me. This is not this is not a reason to view sin lightly, y'all. Sin is real and it hurts people. It hurts God's heart. But this is this is a, a, a reason to never ever ever think that we've lost fellowship with God. To never run away. This is a reason to constantly come back to him. Whether we've not made a mistake in years or whether we made a mistake five minutes ago. <sighs> yeah, that's all. The Lord's telling me that's all, all he has for me to share today. So... And I, I hope y'all have enjoyed this. This has been this has been hard for me to get out, to be honest. It, it's uh, at least my brain is just turned off today a little bit. So I'm sorry for like trying to read and not being able to. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's been a long week already, but that's okay. The Lord is good. Yep, that's all. The Lord's just saying that's all that He has for me to do. So. I just want to say uh, before I end, before I end this, thank you all to everyone who uh, prays for this ministry, for everyone who prays for me and my family and supports us in any way. Um, thank you to everyone who shares these videos uh, and uh, and who shows up for the live streams, that kind of stuff. Y'all are awesome, and uh, I love you, and the Lord loves you, and I'm just praying a blessing over you today, and specifically that the areas in which you've been struggling. And I just sense this from the Lord is a prophetic prayer in a sense, the areas that you've been struggling to have peace in, I'm just praying a blessing of peace over those areas. And then it would be the grace of God coming in that you would begin to have peace because of his grace. Y'all know that grace is unmerited favor, right? It's favor you don't deserve. I'm praying that you would have peace in every area of your life because of God's unmerited favor that he's pouring out upon you. Thank you, Jesus. I love y'all. I'm hopping off. Uh, again, I would encourage you, if you, wanna, if you want more context for this live stream, go watch that uh, other Rapture live stream that I recently streamed back in September. That link is below this one on YouTube. I don't think I have any necessarily any announcements today. Oh, one announcement is I do have an Instagram. I don't push it very often, but I just shared a short prophetic word there that I'm not sharing anywhere else. And I'm actually going to stick some shorter prophecies there that aren't going to wind up on the, on the other 
um, platforms just because these plat you know youtube facebook are so i i post so many videos here that i've decided to post some of the short ones there so if y'all want to see some of those um go follow me on instagram uh, i love y'all so much i'll see you next time